Good morning, everyone. Please come and take your seats. You can come close into the circle. <laughs> no, it's the aliens. Not gonna bite. <laughs> As you know, this is the final installment in uh, Dr. Mark McEnroy's superb series on salvation. Um, there's a handout at the table on your way in. Welcome to Elizabeth Ludicky online. Um, I'll post the handout in the chat soon for you, Liz. But we'll start with prayer and then I'll hand it over to Mark. I will pray the collect of the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day, didst open the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of thy Holy Spirit, shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, with, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Mark. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see you all. Looking forward to our conversation today. And today really has been envisioned as more of a conversation, an open dialogue about the issues that we have been exploring during the course of the series. Um, we've been aware that uh, week in and week out, we've had a lot of ground to cover. We've barreled through and made everyone hold off on their questions until the end, which has been uh, perhaps briefer than would be desired by some. And so we can actually thank Lynn Hartman for suggesting uh, a seventh session, bonus session, during which we could talk over uh, the ground that we have covered and uh, think about any thoughts that have occurred to us during the course of the series as a whole, um, at any point, really, questions, comments, uh, conversation. Um, so what you have for the handout for the day is a summary of the entire series. It's a summary in terms of uh, the points that we've covered, and then also a further reading. There was sort of a request to have kind of in one place all of the reading materials that um, referred to. In addition to the handout for the day, there's also been a request for handouts from various iterations of the series over the past few weeks. So for those seeking um, materials from one or two weeks or you know who, more, we haven't taken attendance, so you know. <laughs> um, or more of those handouts from all six weeks um, are over there uh, on, on the uh, incident. Um, so that's just a, a couple of quick uh, orienting words. Um, it seems that what might be helpful is to go through briefly the ground that we've covered. Uh, and then I will, I promise, I will stop presentation mode and then we can um, shift into a, into a conversation about what we've done. But maybe getting things back into ready recall for all of us um, could be helpful. And we can think of key issues that arose during the course of the last six weeks. Um, so as you will remember, uh, perhaps when we first met, we talked about how the series began. You can see that on the handout there in terms of the, <laughs> the Roman numerals that we covered. Uh, and then the, the first claim that we made about uh, the idea of salvation in the Christian tradition is that it's not one thing but many, right? It's a multifaceted set of ideas, um, whereas with Christology with Trinity, you've got a great deal of effort being exerted in order to get things just right when it comes to Christian theology. Not so with salvation. Salvation, like atonement theories, is a much more uh, capacious set of ideas rather than one single idea. That's kind of one of the reasons to spend six weeks talking about it, really. Mm -hmm. um, so we move from there to just a, a brief mention of salvation's connections to other topics in Christian theology. So it has as we noted at a number of moments, a whole lot to do with Christology, a whole lot to, with an understanding of Jesus Christ, a whole lot to do with theological anthropology, the understanding of the human being and where sin enters in. And as we saw when last we gathered, it has a lot to do with eschatology, has a lot to do with where things are ultimately headed, right? The end, the last things. So those connections, we uh, kind of gestured that that was going to be something we would encounter. And sure enough, we did. Um, and then we got the uh, kind of fundamental point to convey during week one there was the idea that grace is this is the foundation of salvation that salvation is not something that we earn instead it is something that is given to us by god that goes in all kinds of directions that get um, interesting that you if, when we receive something we reserve or don't deserve we're often rather excited about it people we don't like very much receive it we get less excited about it uh and jesus seems to have foreseen this actually in the third bowl of the prodigal son and other <laughs> excuse me other teachings of his um so it, the, the message again and again and again is to 
um, and be generous toward your neighbor, toward uh, your younger brother, for example, mm -hmm. uh, as God has been generous to you. Um, so that was uh, week one for week two. There's the, we didn't do a kind of point by point outline. There's some further reading there though on the on the page. Um, you might remember though what we dealt with with week two was this question about forgiveness of sins and its relationship to righteousness. And there, there's a really uh, intricate and vigorously pursued question in the Christian tradition about whether one is simply declared righteous or whether one actually becomes righteous. And this has um, a, a certain trajectory whereby you have um, Augustine, notably uh, losing perhaps Hebrew context of the term. It seems that the original intention was to talk about um, human beings being declared righteous. Uh, and this is rediscovered during the Protestant Reformation. It has a lot to do with um, uh, Erasmus and the uh, Renaissance leading up to the Protestant Reformation. But all that is to say, uh, the, the, the claim there that we find once we're getting back in touch with the original meaning of the text seems to be that human beings are declared righteous. We're, we're said that we are righteous and we're not, we're not actually made righteous. The reason that matters, the reason that that's something that's worth dwelling on is because if we're made righteous, then somebody like Martin Luther, perhaps us, uh, worry that we wouldn't be made righteous enough in order to be pleasing enough to God. And if we're simply declared righteous, then any shortcomings that we might have that might remain uh, are inconsequential when it comes to God's grace. So it's a message of good news right? to be declared righteous is to be told whatever has uh, transpired uh, previously is not to be taken into account. God is regarding you as righteous, uh, no matter what state you actually are in, which can be a message of good news. Um, there is, though, an open question, as we talked about, about if it's the case, then, that we aren't transformed, does that leave us wanting a bit in our understanding of salvation? Um, this this question is what Simeon Zoll pursues. He's in the, in the readings there, and uh, the basic idea with him was that to simply to be declared righteous, to receive that message from God, is to bring with it enormous relief. It is to bring uh, a, a, a soothing or uh, troubled consciences that we, we get. So it's not simply that we are just told that we're okay. We're told that we're okay, and that brings with it um, enormous benefits to us. So it's not quite as, mm -hmm. as thin an idea as it is sometimes made out to be. So that for that um, first model there, salvation as forgiveness, as you might remember, we were looking at individual notions of salvation. That individual notion of salvation continued into salvation as healing, where we talked about in the first place, the movement from illness to health. So to call salvation healing is to regard sin then as disease, right? Which gives us a different way, as we said at the time of thinking about sin. It's not so much you know, things that we have, have done that we're not terribly proud of, as much as an affliction that, uh, that comes upon uh, the human being. Um, so the idea that we're made for health, we're made for life, the disease is not original to the human being, we talked about next. And then we asked about what does health enable, right? So, so say we are made healthy, say we are, are transformed by God's grace so as to be made healthy. Um, the movement from being healed by Christ to then being a healer with and through Christ for others as we saw with some figures in the early church. As we move to the contemporary setting, we talked about the idea that the healing that might be acutely needed in our age is a healing from anxiety. The movement from anxiety to peace would be a way to talk about this work of healing, this so-called sanative notion of salvation, model of salvation, but bent on, on transformation uh, could be uh, applicable, could be felt in our age. So with that, the, the idea that the, the healing that we encounter from God is going to be both physical, but it's also going to be spiritual, psychological, mental um, as well. And, and perhaps most fundamentally, the notion that that which afflicts us is foreign to us. Right? It's not properly who we are. Mm -hmm. And when God um, um, transforms us, God is ridding us of things that aren't ours to begin with. Right, the things that have kind of latched themselves on to the human condition, but that don't belong to us, properly speaking. Um, not part of our natural being would be another way to put it. So with those two, for forgiveness and healing, we talked about individual notions of salvation. As we move into salvation as true humanity, we move from individual to corporate or communal. 
And uh, we we dwelt for some time on this idea that um, God's salvific work on the human being involves restoring the image of God. And so that right. of restoration is captured in Irenaeus and his idea of recapitulation. So Christ recapitulates human history, does over again what Adam did, not so great the first time yeah. through. Right? So where Adam erred, Christ, uh, Christ succeeds. So through that action, then, we get a new image of God, a restored image of God. And if we want to ask about what that does exactly, that language of, of image of God, of course, is all over the Christian tradition. What exactly it means, what it amounts to, varies tremendously throughout the, uh, throughout the ages. Um, so we talked about two things that a new image yeah. of God does. In the first place, um, repairs fragmentation. So sin, his, sin here is regarded as a splintering. So sin fragments, it pulls us apart from them. Um, the restored image of God then uh, restores that fragmentation. And it does so as we dug a little bit deeper into this uh, reality by correcting the, as it's put, incruvatus in se, that is to say, the, the being curved in on oneself that sin presents to the human being, the, the self-absorption, the, the, the navel-gazing, the un, un, inability to get over oneself. Uh, is a, uh, one way to characterize what sin does. So that restored image of God lifts one get one's gaze, allows one to to look out, if you will, rather than in on the self. And where this all leads is the idea of a, a union in Christ that uh, affects union within all of humanity. Right. So we are one with our neighbor through this action. We are all one humanity, not separate, not isolable human beings. So that was one way to talk about a corporate dimension of salvation, the union of that's affected, a horizontal union, if you will. During week five, we talked about a vertical union, that is to say, a union between the human being, human beings as a whole, and God. Um, so deification is the way in which this language gets expressed within the Christian tradition. And that idea, deification itself, has many different expressions. Uh, throughout scripture. So we spoke of 2 Peter 1, 4, perhaps most notably, the notion that we are made partakers of the divine nature. We participate in God. That's also picked up in various uh, descriptions of divine filiation, as it's put, or being a child of God through adoption mm -hmm. or the Pauline materials by being born from above or reborn, born from God in the Johannine materials, the idea that we are children of God. Mm -hmm. Um, we uh, ask the question, we become God, really? We issue some key qualifications on deification. There's some concerns that that, uh, that, that might arise as one hears that uh, terminology, and sure enough, those have cropped up over the ages. Um, so we talked about the limits. Mm -hmm. We also spoke about Anglicanism as being a particularly rich site for deification, figures such as Richard Hooker uh, being one of them, and the Cambridge Platonists as well, and any number of others. And then finally, we noted that with the, this idea of deification, we're not talking about a mystical flight away from the world, but instead we're talking about being made like God in order to be merciful as God has been merciful, in order to be generous as God has been generous to us. And here I would suggest, although we didn't make the point at the time, in a sense we come full circle to the notion of salvation as being given by grace. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is to say, we have received through God's grace something we don't deserve. The thing to do next is to give to our neighbor things that that person does not deserve either, just as God has been generous to us. Um, so then finally, and then I really will stop presenting, I promise. Um, finally, uh, for week six, last week we talked about salvation as eschatological fulfillment. And here we went from, we started individual, then to corporate or communal. Then here we went to full cosmic, the, the cosmos um, as a whole being the site of God's salvific work. We talked about what ancient Israel hoped for, what the earliest Christians hoped for. And we noted that it was the renewal of creation. It was the establishment in the world of shalom, of peace, peace accompanied by justice, right? this deep, deep um, notion of peace. We noted that as much as that's in the biblical materials, when Christianity is spreading throughout the Mediterranean basin, it's engaging with Greek philosophical forms of thinking, particularly Platonism. And whereas Platonism privileges a flight away from the world, never to return, um, that's not so within Christian theology. There's a commitment, at least at some level, it varies enormously over the centuries, but there's a commitment to materiality. There's a commitment to the body. 
And we see that in the fact that God renews the creation and that the resurrected body is the, um, the, the, the locus where we see the eschaton beginning. The resurrected body of Christ is the first fruits, as Paul puts it, of the general resurrection. And resurrection is not a one-off. It's something that will be all of our uh, inheritance within a Christian theological frame. Mm -hmm. uh, this stands, of course, in tension with not only Platonism, but any number of other ways of thinking that we might encounter today. But it, it bespeaks, I think, just how very good the creation is, how committed God is to the creation. God does not give up on God's creation. This, mm -hmm. by the way, has enormous implications for the environmental situation in which we find ourselves. And we are, mm -hmm. we are stewards of something that's God's. When God gets it back, it better be in better shape than it is now, right? Um, so all kinds of implications there. Um, and then we spoke about the ind indispensability of eschatology, the idea that when we get to the modern period, a lot of this stuff is viewed askance, but it's also held on to in some unexpected ways. The idea that history is progressing towards some sort of better situation, if not a, 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 an ideal situation, uh, as you find within various uh, movements afoot um, within a whole world, world, certainly starting a few centuries beforehand, but that the eschaton, whether explicitly named or not, I would suggest is the lure or the draw that's pulling us toward that um, perfected reality. And so then just we, the close of the idea of the shape of eternal life involving perfected relation with God, other, and self, and that relation involving, as we said before, shalom, peaceful uh, relations, the wolf you know, lying down with the lamb uh, and whatnot, um, but then also um, justice. <laughs> So a little bit of a whirlwind tour. I hope that sounds familiar. I hope we didn't get too far um, into the weeds. Having promised I wouldn't present, I seem to have gone on for longer than I, I intended to. So really the idea at this point was we would open things up quite widely and just have a conversation. Things that uh, perhaps you've wondered about over the course of the last few weeks, comments that occurred to you, thoughts that have been sparked that haven't quite had the time of day to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to get out there. Anybody? So one thing that wasn't covered is that how the gift of salvation has been perverted by organized religion. In other words, you know, you're sinful. We have, you know, the, um, well, like the Roman Catholic Church will take a truly evil person and make them a saint. So they move them from hell to heaven, according to their theology. And so in, in this discussion here, there's no, you didn't really go into how salvation has been used as a weapon against people. Yeah, we made some uh, perhaps oblique references at a few moments about the um, uh, perversions or twistings of, of some of these ideas. These, these ideas have, have, as you're indicating, you know, been used to inflict harm, sin in particular, right? Um, and so we, we've kind of uh, motioned toward that. I suppose the question for me is always, granted that that, that <laughs> happens, inevitably happens, even given when things fall into human hands, uh, that that's the way things go. Um, I suppose it's important to me to make sure that when we think of these things, we don't automatically go there and don't exclusively go there. But instead, we have, have the, a fuller picture in view and uh, have in view um, the... The, the ideal from which these things fall so very, very far. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we've made a few points in that direction, but the, 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 the main thrust, I would say, of the series was to try to give us a sense of the best of what the Christian tradition has to offer here, mm -hmm. acknowledging that any number of um, shortfalls have occurred over the century. Yeah, Jan. Uh, Chelsea, I was just gonna say Chelsea's sermon addresses this this morning as well. Yeah. So I, that's what I was going to say, tagging on to what Dan said. There's so much for us today. And I hope we don't let go of all these different strands because mm -hmm. it's really important. I mean, we're recognizing the importance of the environment, yes. equity and justice, yeah. that uh, God is for all. Yeah. There are a lot of elements that I've been very disturbed by and um, um, questioning my own church. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, for me, that's really important to be reminded of all these things yeah. because it's here and now. Yeah. And I, I think it makes a difference where you are in your own life, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is very different when you're retired. For me, retiring, not being focused on um, my children and my own career. And in the last four or five years, 
it's been a different life for me because I've reflected. And having this is such a gift, really. Thank you. I mean, one of my hopes for, for the series was to demonstrate that a lot of our contemporary concerns that you uh, mentioned, a couple of those, Jan, that, that if one wants to address those, um, one, one can look around to the world in which we live. Um, one can also look into the millennia that have preceded us mm -hmm. within Christianity, because it turns out there's some materials there that furnish some really rich resources mm -hmm. as we're trying to confront these things. And what it also means is that one can't be written off in certain ways in the contemporary setting if one's pulling from this deep tradition, right? So it, it, it's, it's a set of concerns that's once deeply traditional and highly contemporary at the same time. I, I've been in, involved in a lot of different denominations for lack of a better word. And what I have found is they groups pick one of these or maybe two mm -hmm. And that becomes the reality and the reason to separate and say, we are this. But I'm so thankful here that, uh, that we look at all of them. And there's a sense that there's a, a godly dynamic tension in, um, in, in, un, in this material and that we're we're called to hold them all and live in that dynamic tension yeah. and not pick one thing and say this is it yeah yeah that's exactly right that's a wonderful phrase i love that mm -hmm. godly dynamic tension mm -hmm. that's that's the way to, to talk about it right it is this multifaceted reality mm -hmm. you can you can get out one feature of it for a while but it's going to have other dimensions that they don't always stand uh, conveniently next to one another Some, sometimes they tug on one another sometimes they complement one another but to, to call it God, so yeah, yeah. but we're to hold those mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and there's a perennial uh, temptation, tendency, different ways to describe it, I suppose, toward, um, as you suggest, from just kind of landing on one and sticking with that when there's a whole host of, of things of what this means that's out there. Yeah. Mark, I would like to echo what Jan said. The privilege it has been to sit through what to this class. Salvation, I never had an opportunity to study with a scholar of salvation. So thank you. I'd like you to go back, if you would, to the question of universal salvation for a moment or a few moments. And just, I am a more literal person. How does, so say the Israelites, we looked at their background, they didn't know Jesus. Uh, how are they saved? How are deeply evil people um, in our world um, saved? Yeah. How did, Oh, take me through a few examples if you want. Yeah, we could do a whole other class on this. It's my reason to make, make a brief gesture toward it and then hope for the best um, during during our class. Um, yeah, so 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 you you can identify at least two sets of issues in play: those who so with um, our our Jewish brothers and sisters and siblings, uh, and others not knowing Christ would be one thing that that comes up in questions of universalism. Um, and then there's the question of, of evil as well, right? Those are truly, truly um, uh, just horrific things. What do we do with, what do we do with them? Um, the former is easier than the latter, I think, in terms of, of the ways that have been articulated and things that we might, might be sympathetic to. So what one finds in the, the 20th century is a real interest in this topic of, of universalism, so much so that you've got the most influential theologians within the Protestant tradition, Catholic tradition and Orthodox tradition, all talking about either full on universalism or another very similar idea known as inclusivism, which says that God um, can include non Christians in God's plan of salvation. Um, so, for Protestants, it's Karl Barth, 
um, for Catholics. It's uh, both Karl Rahner and Hazardous von Balthasar, whom we've talked about. Uh, and then in Orthodoxy, it's uh, Sergei Bulgakov, whom we mentioned very briefly last week. So, I mean, these are, these are, these are the most influential figures, and they're all talking about this issue. Um, both Bulgakov and Bard go full-on universalist. So they say God not only can, but will save all. They do through, through very different uh, theological mechanisms or arguments. Um, both Balthazar and Ron will talk about inclusiveness and say God can include God's uh, non-Christians in God's plan for salvation. Um, so to, to I'm thinking of which among these would be best to address the concerns you've articulated. I think Ron is probably the best for the non Christian for those those who do not know Christ. Mm -hmm. So what Roger says is that, excuse me, um, it is not the case that God's grace is confined to the church. And what is instead the case is that God has poured out God's grace beyond the bounds of the church itself, such that all human beings are touched by that grace, transformed by that grace, and because of that, can be saved by God, be integrated into God's plan. Um, uh, whether whether it's is uh, explicitly identified or not, Rhino says this grace is everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, a good example, scripture wise, today's a good day is is the Holy Spirit falling on Cornelius and his family, mm -hmm. who had no knowledge of any of this. It just happened, yeah. 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 and so there there wasn't any knowledge required about who God was, who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And and I know of multiple examples of that being true today, where people just almost out of the blue meet Jesus and, and uh, come to a belief. So there's a sense that the availability is always there, yeah. Yeah. and not by our the way we see things happen. Right. Right, right. We're yeah. too restrictive in mm -hmm. how we view what God's doing. Yeah. Right. Pentecost is a good good day to talk about this. I think. Yeah, the spirit <laughs> flowing where it will, um, and 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 it, it drives home. Like what you're articulating, Roger drives home the fact that um, more limited notions of salvation serve an institutional church. In yeah, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit is concerned to varying degrees with the institution of the church, and uh, might might go elsewhere. In the Holy Spirit's house. That's the go elsewhere. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Poured out on all flesh. Yes, the yes, indeed. Spirit is poured out. Yes, yes, indeed. indeed. Yeah, we're, we're in the midst of a couple of things, but, but um, I do you want to jump what, in? What, what I've read from Roar and others is, is this concept of the cosmic Christ, which gets us away from this idea where you have to know Jesus right. personally. Right. Uh, and when you think about God's creative power as this sort of cosmic sense, um, it makes it much easier to think about everybody yeah. being able to be saved and not just in the Christian church. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know where that concept fits in, in it fits in some cases quite closely, yeah. The, the, the idea that there is, you know, there's knowing. Um, the person of Jesus of Nazareth and the way in which his ministry unfolded. Uh, that is certainly obviously a major feature of Christian tradition, but Christianity also claims that it's through this second person of the Trinity that all of creation was made and that it bears the imprint of that cosmic Christ. Uh, and then there's, in addition to that, the, the joining of, uh, of, of God to humanity as a whole. Right? So God, yes, uh, dwelt within, uh, was incarnate in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, but that has implications for all of human beings. All of humanity is then transformed, which gets at some of those universalist things that, that Lynn was wondering about. Um, just to, I, I, I want to make sure we don't eschew the problem of evil too easily. I know that was one major thing. I'm sure it's on, on others as well. Um, I mean, notoriously, notoriously thorny issue within Christian theology. Uh, and, and to not only ask, as Christian theology does, in any number of other theologies, well, why would uh, an all-powerful and all-good God, omnibenevolent God, allow evil. Right? Those things don't seem to, to work. Uh, but then to, to, to up the ante a bit, Lynn, and ask, why would someone be saved who has done this evil, tremendous evil? And we can easily think of um, any number of people um, who seem to fit this. Uh, 
Um, so there's the there's no easy way to get at the question. Um, one one feature of Bulgak that I think is, um, is 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 rich for us to to ponder maybe for a moment or two. You know, he, we mentioned last time that he has this uh, envisioning in his universalist scheme or his universalist understanding. He had this idea that you've got a God who's going to with infinite love who's going to love a finite human being who might try to resist that love, but will ultimately not be able to do so because of the fact that human beings are finite and God is infinite. Yeah. Um, what, we, what we didn't mention at the time was one feature of what's happening there is that in Bulgakov's understanding, and he's drawing from big, some figures in the tradition too, as the human being is being kind of uh, slowly eroded, if you could say, by divine love, there is a um, an extraordinarily painful revisiting of the harms that that person has inflicted in one's life, such that one goes through in this comprehensive manner um, all of the evils that one has done, and one one feels them oneself um, as the the evils that they were inflicted on on others. Right. So so in other words, there's it, it, it's not simply you know being moved to apologize or something like that. It's a, it's, it's a much more intense purgation that, they, that the individual is undergoing as a result of that firsthand awareness of what one has done mm -hmm. oneself. And you and that can happen in uh, this life or after death? It, it, it certainly can happen in, in this life. What Bulgakov envisions is that it is it, um, one tempted to say inevitably happen, if not in this life, then in the next, right? So that's something that that we will undergo. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that at least does some work in this really, really tough arena. Mm -hmm. and, and and what it means, I mean, to the satisfaction of some is that it's it's not an easy pass, right? It's not, you know, okay, God, God forgives as God has forgiven uh, others. And this person about whom we might be really, really troubled is therefore offered um, salvation. There's a, there's something for that person to undergo. It, it's not a, not a cheap or easy grace that that person receives. Instead, it's it's. I mean, we talked about grace being transformative. So, I mean, this is a different kind of transformative, transformative awareness of what one has done that has caused harm and and a deep, deep repentance that ensues. I really like that because I, what what brought to mind was that story of the guy in hell just wanting a drop of cold mm -hmm. water from the other guy, yeah. and there wasn't. There wasn't what there wasn't a purgation that this fellow went through. There wasn't even an opportunity, yeah. and that's what um, that's what's so magnificent about salvation. That um, that now today, um, what you've brought to us to um, hear and understand is that there is grace and salvation for all, and um, that. There is work to do <laughs> for yeah. us humans. Yeah. And and that's the, the great thing is that there is work to do, but it's being offered to us to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's just um, so beautiful. Yeah. And yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, yeah. uh, well, and, and thank you. I mean, I think one of the, to my mind, the deep riches of um, the Episcopal Church of Protestant Christianity more broadly is the idea, precisely as you put it, that there is work to do. At the very same time, that salvation can be proclaimed with confidence, right? Mm -hmm. So, 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 so we're, the, the the work we have to do isn't so that we can secure our salvation. No, it's already there. It's, I think it, that's the coolest thing. It's, it that's is. What you gave me, Margaret. I walked out of here thinking, like, okay, Kathy, you know, like, I mean, I guess I just ended at that. Okay, Kathy, mm -hmm. you know, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so very much. It's truly profound, I think, it to, is. It's truly to, profound. To, to make salvation not the, you know, keeping up with the Joneses yeah. that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, not and we, that we don't transpose that attitude onto God. Yeah, Jim. Well, it's uh, given us an opportunity and encouraged us to self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And I think our reading in the book group has really, really helped us. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, I see this my grandmother's hand. Mm -hmm. and, and to realize... Uh, 
we failed. We we uh, we uh, we've been challenged. Um, we've even added to the problem. Uh, and and how to recognize that mm -hmm. it's available. Mm -hmm. um, but we have work to do. That's how I feel about myself. Um, and the the other thing that I think we've done here that I hope we continue to do is to expose ourselves to difference. Um, uh, Phil's daughter converted to Judaism, and we have sat, sat at Seder, and uh, we we were with with family uh, last last weekend, and uh, yeah, I love them, and I I've, I've known I've had a lot of Jewish friends, and I've been drawn to them for a very long time, but there are other examples getting in Ramadan. Uh, we Phil and I also went to Temple Aaron uh, at, close to Thanksgiving, and there were 14 uh, denominations reflected all together. And uh, there's nothing that helps me to feel better uh, than when I'm with all mm -hmm. of the other and know I'm with the other as well. Right. And I just right. I, I just hope we do that. I, I you know we have Episcopal Church that's all down. I mean it's it's diminishing. But but um to, uh, at Thanksgiving to share with we think of what we have going down Summit Avenue. We have Greek, we have Jewish, we have Episcopalian, we have Roman Catholic, um uh we have other denominations and why can't we be with them and 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 it used to be uh, the cathedral with the downtown churches used to rotate every Thanksgiving um, the the different important parts of, of the service were shared by the different people so we heard we we heard uh, 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 sermons and homilies from all the different as as we went and I you know I just I I, I just mm -hmm. I'm I'm just so grateful to remember um, sitting with my ten year old daughter. Listening to a sermon from the West, the the pastor at Westminster Presbyterian, and she said that was really a good sermon. <laughs> uh, you know, couldn't have been better for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. This is certainly a time to be uh, focusing on unity. I think yeah. among people of different faiths, different denominations. Mm -hmm. On this, I'll just mention quickly. I make a quick plug for someone who was in the doctoral program with me, who has just published a book on uh, Judaism as being fundamentally about love. Mm -hmm. uh, Shai Held is his name. The book's mm -hmm. getting a lot of attention. Um, and um, I had kind of lost track of him. And then suddenly, see, wow, he's got this book is getting uh, just a, a lot of praise. And so, so what, what he wants to mm -hmm. take some efforts to correct is notions of Judaism as kind of severe and law-abiding that one finds um, with the Christian tradition is certainly, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, participates in this. Uh, in, in, a, in a major way. And so to instead say that, that love is at the heart of Judaism, uh, it offers an important corrective. So Shai Hell uh, is his name. And it's, but by all accounts, it's it's a really uh, quite gripping uh, book. Uh, Christine, that's how you hand it then May. Well, I, I too, thank you, Mark, for all the work and time and effort you put into here. And I know my brain is kind of overloaded and it's been wonderful, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to share that one <laughs> I took away from this was I really feel like a lot of these theologians, whether they're ancient or more modern, have sometimes just gone overboard. <laughs> and I, what it has done for me is to drive me back to the scripture. And then, okay, let's read it. Keep it on it. Let's digest it and spit it out. But at the end, Let's go back to what they started with. Let's go back to the scripture and hear from God. Yeah. Let, let's hear about his great love for us, that Christ died for us, that he rose so we have life again. Let, let's hear about the the part in Pauline letters where if someone doesn't speak up and talk about him, the stones will talk. I mean, God has left a way open for everyone to hear, and it's right there in Scripture. And I need to make sure that I'm grounded in that first before I'm grounded in any, any of the theologians, as much as I love them or hate them, you know, kind of this mixed bag uh, kind of thing. But the other thing that really struck me, especially the last couple of sessions, was that God looks at our heart. We don't have that opportunity as Christians to see what is in the heart 
even of the person that we are most intimate with on earth. We don't have that ability. And so it's made me step back and say, okay, I don't know what's really going on with this person. I can't judge. And so what what am I left with? I can pray. I can offer up that person or that situation, that angst, that whatever to God and trust that his grace and his love and his salvation that he's given us, he will make it come around right. Yeah. I think that's that's crucially important. And mm -hmm. and and to to recall it, you know, we we don't know what's in another person's heart. Mm -hmm. Um we we also uh, if we were to look at ourselves would find shortcomings of various sorts, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one of the, one of those features of scripture that comes out again and again. There's a there's a, a, a beam in your own eye, and you're pointing up the speck in somebody else's, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and 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 so 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 what that means, kind of to return to one of the, the points made moments ago, is that you know we have fallen short, and yet we have received or have received grace. Um, perhaps what we should do then mm -hmm. is extend what we've received through God to those who are uh, challenging us in various ways, which is, of course, easier said than done. <laughs> but, 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 but we have something deeply important uh, with what God has done for us. Um, about scripture, too, I'm, I'm glad that this has driven you back to the scriptures. That's, that's the place to go to find any number of ideas. I mean, we, we have you know, done just a thin slice. Well, and God is, has challenged us to test what we hear and to test him, to see that, you know, and certainly Abraham did that over and over again yeah. and um verbally and non-verbally so yeah, yeah let's let's move in with the ancients yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one hope of the series has been to demonstrate that while well, theologians do get carried away I'm sympathetic yeah. to that. <laughs> um, there, there are there are lines of continuity right so, so we have some scriptural foundations that in some places in some cases are a little unclear on exactly where it goes, exactly how it, it should be uh, played out. And so in, in a best case scenario, what tradition does is start to refine some of those uh, uh, moments when we don't have full clarity and and get things uh, better understood. Of course, it goes in, in another direction at various moments as well. And there's a need to return in some cases as we saw that notion of righteousness as declarative uh, in particular. Um, so, you know, there's it, it, always a grappling, I suppose, yeah. that um, benefits from getting back to the source. To be sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I think the greatest gift that I've taken from this series is the call to mercy. Mm -hmm. I can get my hands around that. Mm -hmm. I can I get my head around that. And it echoes something that some great spiritual mentors have taught me over the years, and they all happen to be old nuns. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, we are called to maintain compassionate connection. I can do that. I can do that. Good for you, Mary. Protestant. Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that someone wanting to do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the TV is going to turn on soon. <laughs> Tom Evans, did you have a comment? Maybe not. Just if that throws clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> One takeaway from this is the uh, communal aspect of, of salvation that, you know, in our American toxic individualism to the point where you know we're destroying ourselves, whereas this communal and part of that also is and, and, um, the other sources that you know the non white, non male uh, theologians who are looking back to other sources. Uh, uh, you know Julian of Norwich and and you know these other great theologians who were non non not male non white, uh, and th that universalism that communalism that it is was, uh, was Jesus is the I am divine you are the branches mm -hmm. you know it's that uh, being able to accept that as our communal 
uh, as our salvation is not just you're being saved, but that we're all being saved. We're all moving forward. Yeah. So that that's a powerful lesson to be heard. I think, so. I, heard. I think so. I mean, Roger spoke a while ago about the tendencies for some portions of Christianity to focus in on one feature of salvation to the neglect of others. And I think the, the individual view of salvation is, is a big one. It's, it's one that um, any number of uh, folks have latched on to um, over the relatively recent times that is in need of a real corrective. So that we, we do see that communal dimension. We see that uh, our work and God's work through us, through the church involves not just, you know, getting ourselves figured out, um, but instead uh, all of humanity. Can. And perhaps we will um, atypically finish in a timely manner and get everyone to search in time. Uh, let's close with prayer. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we give you deep, deep thanks for the opportunity to gather these weeks to speak of your grace, to speak of the salvation that you offer. To get to know, we hope, the gift you have given to us. We would ask, Lord, that you help us to keep in mind just how manifold your graces are. The work that they do on us and our neighbors. Bring us into union with you, union with one another. And help us this Pentecost to feel the movement of your spirit to help it to blow us into reconciling relation. Help us to extend to others the mercy you have so magnanimously extended to us. All of these things we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.